and good morning, uh, Brother Flannoy. How's it going? Good, good. Uh, so this is the first podcast with somebody in the apartment, so normally it's Zoom calls, so I do apologize for the weird audio, but that's the way it's going to be, so. Just roll with what you got. Right? <laughs> yeah, people have put up with my cats <clears throat> for a whole bunch of stuff, so it just actually kind of cool to have somebody in person. Um, I do know there's some other people who actually do have podcasting in their, their house, so, you know, one day, but not, not over here, <laughs> but, uh, it's awesome. <clears throat> I do apologize. Um, so this is really exciting because this podcast actually started by one of your chaplain core colleagues, um, uh, chaplain Picard, uh, he was the Jewish rabbi that was on Kadena during um, COVID and he started being very outgoing. In fact, I would say he's the chaplain I've seen the most of not just coming around for official unit functions, but actually stopping by to see how people are handing out treats, making himself open and available to where people were like, I didn't even know that there were Jewish chaplains. Um, and something he talked about was resiliency. There's always a, there's always a spirituality and people always tie that to religion and while they're connected, he's saying that you can be spiritual without being religious. In fact, most people that are religious are actually more spiritual than they are religious. Okay. And so I ran with that and that's what this has become. So I've gone from a blog, throwing out theological ideas and thoughts I had to actually starting to interview people. So like that's it. a little bit about that. And so this is kind of exciting for me. Um, I'm trying not to geek out too much, but uh, <laughs> uh, for those who don't know, what is a chaplain? And then can you kind of go through like how you got felt inclined or called to do that? Okay, good. Um, okay, so a chaplain is, uh, very often we think, especially in the military, we think military chaplains, but a chaplain in general is somebody who is a religious ministries professional working for an institution that is not inherently religious, right? Mm -hmm. So if I take somebody who is a, um, a preacher or a priest, typically you imagine I'm gonna, that person's gonna work for their religious organization. They're gonna do the religious rites that are connected there, or a rabbi, I'm gonna work in a synagogue, something along those lines. The chaplain is I take that same person and I put them into an organization that is not inherently religious. NFL teams, right? We saw this um, a couple of weeks ago with kind of the prayers. That's why we have chaplains on those fields is so that they can deal with when a team is up and the underdog absolutely thumps them, right? How did that team gain meaning? It helps coaches, but it also helps individual players on an individual spirituality level. But then when we see moments like trauma um, happening where we see players pass out nearly by how do I help these, these professionals, these NFL players whose game, right, is their profession, how do I help them cope with this really human moment at a spiritual or religious level, right? Uh, we have chaplains in prisons, hospitals, hospice ministry is one of the best ones because I'm, those are where I'm really having to cope with the fact that life, or the cope at least with the question, is life limited or does it continue on in these types of things? So that's largely chaplaincy, is this religious aspect in a non-religious context, right? Um, for me personally, how I came into chaplaincy, I knew about chaplaincy uh, in my graduate studies. I, so I grew up um, as a Latter-day Saint. My grandfather was a Southern Baptist uh, preacher and my mother joined the church right before I was born. So I was, I was the first one in my family really raised in the church. Um, but kind of, like I say, growing up in the South, grandson right next door, we live right next door, um, grandson of, of a preacher, I knew about religious differences, right? Um, elementary school, went to Catholic school. Um, high school, I went to a uh, Baptist school. My freshman year in college was at a Church of Christ seminary uh, in West Virginia. My undergrad, was in Jewish studies, right? So kind of, I had kind of this experience and exposure to a lot of different faiths. And they were all key in my development as a Latter-day Saint, right? So I grew up kind of growing up and really developing my membership in the church and my own testimony. Um, grew up, that was in conversation with others, right? It wasn't just kind of in that. So I knew about kind of 
and, and obviously kind of knowing about religious ministries professionals as you get exposed to all these different faith groups. Uh, I, so I went on my mission and I was like, man, I'd love to do this, but the church doesn't have me. But we don't have paid ministry, so that's just not a thing for me. I got done with my mission uh, and decided to start school, and I wanted to do linguistics um, as a major, and then religious studies because I really liked it as a minor. And I had some really good advice from somebody who said, don't, as a Latter-day Saint, don't go into religious studies. Right? It's just, it's a bottleneck, it's a bad professional choice right, to do that. Uh, and he's absolutely right. It's the same advice I give everybody, uh, every Latter-day Saint, don't go into religious studies. Don't put the investment into that degree, right, because it's just going to be a bad choice. Um, but I felt inspired. Uh, I felt really, like really directed to switch my major and minor. So I got my undergrad in religious studies. Uh, that was in North Carolina. We moved out to Utah. I did a master's in sociology at BYU. Um, and then at that point, I was really kind of really felt like I was going to teach religious studies at like a small liberal arts university. Right? Um, and I was really excited about that. I wanted to do uh, not just religious studies, but Christian theology. And so I went to Vanderbilt's Divinity School and got my uh, master's of theological studies there. And graduated. Uh, I graduated in 2008. So you can imagine, right? Um, job opportunities were not that great afterwards. And so as uh, my wife and I were uh, just trying to figure out what we we're going to do, he said I knew about chaplaincy. I knew I had no, no desire to do it. Uh, definitely not in the military. Um, I had been anti-military for uh, for quite a while. I the mil the high school I went to was a Baptist military school, so I had already had that experience uh, in my life. But then the Lord was like, No, no, I want you to do this. And so we uh, we applied, and, and it was almost immediate when it just kind of that switch and that uh, as far as that door opening for us, uh, it was a very it was a very sudden shift, and that's, we ended up here. So. That's awesome. Um, I think that's kind of really good on your your life experience. Something I noticed the Lord is always like direct. The Lord is guiding us. Mm -hmm. um, and we never go through something that's not preparing us for ourselves, but mostly for those that we come in contact with. So having that broad uh, spectrum of different religious backgrounds, cultural backgrounds, identities uh, is hundred, like 100% 100 useful towards military application because mm -hmm. you see all walks of life. And um, I would say in 2023, while the military is not specifically christian i would argue it's the most religious it's ever been because people have far more options and outlets to practice spirituality um so i'm kind of cheating because i know the answer to this question but um <laughs> what is the process of actually becoming a chaplain in the military um yeah so bachelor's degree in order to get a master's degree a graduate level the DOD has switched between the actual hours required in the grad program, but in general, it's typically about a three-year degree, which matches up to most seminaries. Uh, that master's degree has to be in something where the preponderance of the content is oriented towards religion. Right? Mm. Um, and so you do you have that master's degree and then two years of professional experience uh, as well, professional ministry experience. Um, that at, when I came in, my two years of being a missionary before counted uh we've had chaplain candidates who are going through the program and then they get they graduate and then they were told no you need to do two years afterwards so the DOTB has switched the specifics of the requirement but generally that's it bachelor's degree grad degree and something to do with religion and then two years professional experience yeah i remember on my mission um there was a brother in the ward that um i know for the church of jesus christ Latter-day Saints, there's a specific, uh, you have to be a, a, a worthy member. Yes. Um, you have to have good standing, and then you have to be temple married, I believe, if I remember right. And he was waiting on the last, he, he had checked all the boxes except for the marriage <laughs> one. <laughs> and so he's like, I, I don't know what's going on. And I really wish I kept up with him. I, I, I think he would have been a great chaplain, but I don't, I feel like life went a different way for him. So, so good reminder. I skipped the last one, the last part there. The other requirement is you have to be endorsed by a religious organization uh, as well. So somebody has to be, be, and each of the different services, Army, Air Force, and Navy, all have some different specifics the way they require, the way they mention it. But all of them touch on you have to be able to 
be your religion, right? And so you have to be authorized to do that religious services, um, it, which is unique because we are actually hired. I, I am hired to be a Latter-day Saint, right? I'm not hired in, uh, where my membership in the church is an accident to the hiring. It's an intentional and essential element of it as well. And so, yeah, we do have to have the endorsement. The church has recently changed its requirements. Um, it had a few years ago moved away from an all male chaplaincy in the civilian world. So the church was recommending and endorsing uh, some of our sisters to be chaplains at universities, at hospitals. Uh, I think we've had have some at prisons as well. Uh, and so we saw the value that that the that that side, the sisters' contribution was bringing, um, and it has recently expanded now to where. Uh, even our single sisters are being endorsed for military chaplaincy as well. Uh, so the, the church is broadening its, its chaplaincy pool as well. Yeah, there was a, it was pretty big because it caused some controversy. Um, I know that a lot of the online military members of the church, there was a lot of back and forth, you know, what's the whole point? And then um, I think what a lot of people came down to is, well, why aren't there a lot more worthy male priesthood holders pursuing this thing? That's, I feel like that's what people went to, but not that sisters can't do the job. And um, I remember having a female chaplain at my technical training. She was, a, I want to say, some sort of Protestant. And um, she was she was awesome. She remembered everyone's names. You know, it's, it's tech school. It's not really stressful, but it's, I would say it's different because, you know, everyone's new to the military and stuff. But uh, yeah. Um, yeah, there's a lot of chaplains. Uh, I remember working in um, a nursing home, um, possibly one that Thomas S. Monson would frequent when he was alive. Um, and those hospice calls, I'd say, probably are the hardest one. Um, I remember that we actually had a patient who was a child conscript in um, the SS, uh, Nazi Germany, and uh, he wanted to talk to a chaplain because um, he knew his time was up, so... Uh, that was really kind of interesting. Uh, he had some issues where he basically resorted straight to nothing but German. So they had to go find somebody who could talk to him. But th th I think they found somebody in the church who actually served a mission in Germany and was able to talk to him. Um, and yeah, the football thing recently, a lot of people just realized there's chaplains on football teams and sport teams and do a lot of stuff too. Um, I remember going, I went to basic training for the Air Force around 2013, 2014. That was an interesting time for uh, different, there was a whole bunch of nonsense that was happening. And I came in the fallout of like all the bad choices people made. And so it was just a really weird time. Like we watched movies and it was really relaxed and it was a different time. Um, but we on Sundays had the opportunity to go to church um, and if you gamed it right and you had a battle buddy, you could be at church all day. And that, <laughs> I'm not saying I did that, but theoretically. theoretically, I gamed the system and I was gone all day. Um, in fact, that was the first place the Air Force was hosting um, a humanist chaplain uh, who qualified as a humanist atheist focused chaplain do that. Um, I can't remember what they called it. It was like a circle. And it was basically venting hour um, and random discussions. That was really interesting. And they had a whole bunch of different programs, traditional Protestant and stuff like that. So it's been, it's been interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I really like, I, and I'll say kind of on that, talking about the services that we provide, I've really enjoyed the, uh, the opportunity not only to, to do Latter-day Saint services. Um, I've done a couple of those on ship deployments, uh, but also to do just the general Christian services. Um, I really, it, part of the reason I really love that is because it kind of breaks down. Uh, in, again, working with Navy, small boys, you've only got 350 people, right? You're not going to have the full breadth of services you would at like a training command or something like that. Um, but I've really enjoy, I really enjoy doing that general Christian service because everybody's coming because that was the only... Christians, or if you're a Christian of any stripe, that was legitimately your only sh service on board. 
Um, and so just watching some of those barriers fall away. Now that did put a lot of weight on me to be as general and open in the message that I was um, sending out as possible, but uh, it was a unique experience. We may have an issue, I don't know. The computer shouldn't be doing that, but uh, we'll see. Oh, we're still recording, so. Um, yeah, uh, we, because I've been in this ward for, or this branch for five years, and it is a military focused, there's, there's been, a, I've seen a lot of chaplains that are for the church, and um, oh, what was his name? His wife made the best chocolate chip cookies, because um, they were highly involved with uh, the young single adults at the time, and that poor man got ship duty like too much, too frequent. Um, was that the uh, Scarboroughs? I think so. The oh, Scarborough. So, yeah. yeah. He, yeah. he, you would just have this look like Sunday. I'm like, you're going on a ship again, aren't you? And he's like, yeah. Um, so that's, that's different being on a ship isolation. Um, I heard there was that Navy deployment that like broke record for post world war, post war, just stuck at sea basically and yes. they started having real bad issues i heard that chaplain was working you know sleeping sleeping when he could working 24 hours basically mm -hmm. um, now that being said that so the chaplain did a lot of work but the chaplain also did a really good job of working with the command to spin that right so you can take any stress in life and it can either be a trauma that defines you by your by what it does to you right or you can define it as a trauma that defines you and what you were able to do with it right and so you take it right and the thing the same thing is happening right it's still a traumatic experience we don't take that away but with what i do with meaning making and what we can how we define the thing right allows it to also we control how it defines us so the chaplain did a really job working with the with the command to say this is going to be long it's going to be torturous so we need to be clear about that we don't need to sugarcoat that we actually need to embrace it and we need to talk to the crew about how this is an achievement about how this is an accomplishment about how this is a demonstration of how strong we are and they did that from the very beginning right and had it all the way through and as i've talked to as i've talked to the the rmt the religious ministries team that was on, on board there that was exact they came off and they were like yeah, we did that, you didn't. It, that was very much their perspective. And it wasn't, oh, the Navy did this to us. That difference in meaning and direction of action is essential to how I come out of that experience, right? And so, yes, it, so the chaplains were doing a lot of work, right? Because obviously it, it is a trauma to spend that much time at sea, no port visits, nothing, right? You're seeing the same gray and blue all around you all day long. Um, that's rough, but to be able to take that rough experience and then control it uh, as well also mitigated a lot of the potential issues from it. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> I've worked in a weird position within my, my duty and unit. and um, Most people will never get to work next to their commander and they only see them at commander calls and stuff like that, but um, I ended up being very, in my opinion, I was too close. <laughs> <laughs> um, they were great. They were great and stuff, but I got to really see um, how integrate or how critical um, having that perspective is. The, the Air Force is a little bit different. Um, our first shirts are a little bit more like um, chaplain light, <laughs> if, if we want to put it that way. Whereas other branches, they're more punitive, but they, they work with the commander to basically associate stuff. And, and so I saw a lot of that, but with a lot of the things that we went through, I got to see the chaplain actually coming in. Hey, um, I was out visiting. This is what I'm hearing. This is something I would suggest you might try uh, looking at doing this. Um, uh, when I was at my unit, we lost a young man here um, around COVID time due to a water accident. And that um, chaplain Picard came in immediately um, provided command team and was working with mental health services so um it's really interesting of like how broad your office is mm -hmm. if 
if that makes sense. And that influence that you can have. Um, sadly, I've seen a lot of chaplains come out for sad things. Um, at my previous base, we lost a member to an off an off base incident. He ended up passing away from it. Um, so it was just really weird to be called into work on a Saturday morning and you know see a dude with a cross on a shirt and like this is kind of weird. We're not getting hemmed up for DUI, are we? Right. <laughs> the chaplain's there for a DUI. It's going to be a real bad one. But uh, um, to see that perspective of aiding and then working with other service other professional services like I'm, I remember the base psychologist actually showed up for that and I was like oh that's I'm kind of impressed yeah um, do you feel like there's some hesitancy of people wanting to work with chaplains because at the end of the day you're still going to be associated like you said you are called by your faith you're hired strictly um, by that bias do you feel like there's a barrier to that or is that like not a barrier but that's a strength um it can be a strength um and it can be a barrier so we talk about well, we talk about a lot of things in life that are the ideal and then there's the actual right um and the ideal of the chaplain is that they're able to function in a in a pluralistic environment in a place where not everybody is their faith group right and that's that's the expectation um, and I think most chaplains are able to function within that, right? Um, they're able to not fail that aspect of the mission, but that doesn't mean that they necessarily succeed. And that's one of the hard challenges is a lot of our chaplains are coming out of seminaries, where seminaries are designed to train somebody specific to that religion, right? I, I want to be able to train a priest to be a priest, right? they're not getting a ton of, unless they're going through a chaplain specific program. I mean, there are some graduate programs designed for chaplaincy. Unless you're getting that, they're not getting a ton of training on how to be pluralistic, right? And their, their own faith and spiritual development is not wrapped around conversation. It's not wrapped around what I call translation, where I take the things that, how I see the world, and then I just want to translate that and use some other language to describe the same thing so that others can kind of understand what we're talking about, right? Not necessarily hiding what I'm talking about, but just making it understandable, right? And so a lot of our chaplains aren't trained in how to do that. So while I say that they don't fail at functioning in a pluralistic environment, I think for a lot of chaplains, it's, there is a struggle to find relevancy in the day-to-day, -day, in a lot of day-to-day. -day. Now, yes, when we're talking about death, when we're talking about tragedies, when we're talking about high stress events, these types of things, definitely. But those are kind of peak and rarities they're not the they're not me turning a wrench every day moments right um which ends up i think being a weakness because mo most people in the west already put religion in a separate category of their life right so i've got i've got my work life i've got my home life i've got religious life and a lot of folks will talk about oh well you know my religion permeates everything i'm like that's cool and all but you don't turn your wrench in a religious way, right? And, and that becomes, that's an important delta. That means that there's aspects of my life where I'm not thinking religiously, right? I'm thinking professionally. And that means that there is a distinction between the two in, in our lives. And if I come in and I'm being religious, as a chaplain, I'm, I'm coming in and, and I'm looking for those religious moments, I'm looking for the stressful moments, that means by and large, I actually am not relevant to the command in the day-to-day -day life, right? And I'm not able to really bring this aspect of spirituality to people. Right? And again, until we get those exceptional moments. Right? Um, so yeah, I, I see it as a, I see it as a liability, but it is also a strength for people who start to ask them these questions, right? If I go through the death, or if I go, if I'm getting married, or if I have a baby come in life, or if I'm suddenly brought face to face with the consequences of my choices and I realize I've been making great choices, maybe I'm thinking about religion. Yeah, now I can go and I know that this is a person who's trained to think religiously and that's a strength there. Um, but a lot of it wraps around, again, like I said, the, the lack of training in how to be religious and be authentic to my faith. Um, at the same time that I'm in conversation with people that don't think that. And that's where we get into the value to go to um, kind of how you experience chaplain Picard talking about it, right? 
um, is this difference between religious and spiritual, right? And a lot of a lot of folks now talk about spirituality as an alternative to religion, right? I'm I'm spiritual but not religious, not religious. And the conversation is growing. I really I kind of help jump. Uh, John Picard was talking about it being, you know, some people are religious and spiritual, right? I think part of the problem is, is that we've got a lot of people in America now who are realizing that they and their families um, have grown up very religious, but not spiritual, right? So I'm doing the things in my faith. I'm, I'm going to church. I'm, for us as Latter-day Saints, right, I'm doing my calling. I'm hitting all the check marks, but they don't affect how I turn my wrench, right? It's, it, it's very much segmented still, and it's not pervasive in my identity. I, I identify as a particular religion, check, but yeah, how I turn my wrench, how I turn my steering wheel when I'm driving, these types of things aren't actually defined by that. Um, that's, and that, I think that's kind of the friction point there. Yeah, he uh, he was going on to say that the spirituality is the driving mechanism, and religion is sort of the haltering guidance of that motivation of what gets you out of bed in the morning. Uh, religion is the car to drive you to work. Um, there's different cars. There's trucks. There's motorcycles. They they're different, um, and some people walk, and so you have to have a balance, right? And I feel like you are right that people lean to side. And I would say members of the church are very guilty of leaning into the religious aspect. When they do have a faith crisis, they've not built that spirituality. They don't have that um, yin and yang aspect to it of being well-rounded to couple with that. And so when they have to use those tools, they've not developed, developed them. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's where a lot of people and myself in the past being immature, oh, this church isn't true. Jesus went through hard stuff, so you're going to go through hard stuff. And how do we best navigate that hard stuff? Mm -hmm. um, and that's something I was super excited to talk to you about. And I was like, if there's anybody that's dealing with hard stuff that, that's a chaplain, seeing that from an outside perspective... Um, what would you say would be the worst thing a person could do going through a hard thing? Um, death in the family, spousal issues, family issues. Uh, let's say um, they got caught doing something illegal, so now there's like a, a punitive action on the way. Uh, what have you seen is like mm, they're not going, they're going about this the wrong way. So, uh, universally, right, regardless of what it is, um, it's, it's trying to operate in the realm of control, right? And that's, and I say that not just when something, somebody's going through something, but even when they're going through life in general. We have this idea that we're in control of things, right? And so, let's say I'm going through a death. And you th we think about our five stages of grief, right? And I know there's all sorts of controversy about the order and whether those are relevant, those types of things. It's still a good framework to think about grief in general, right? And, and how I deal with something. So I've got my my rejection, right? This isn't true. This isn't. Real. Well, that's me trying to control reality. I don't want reality to look like that, so I'm going to deny that this thing is actually real, right? I'm trying to I'm trying to create reality the way I want it to be, right? Then we've got the bargaining. Okay, fine. So it actually is this way, but maybe I can still do something to alter it in some way, right? Um, we've got our depression, right? And that's where I relinquish my control over myself, which I still have, but I relinquish that to the situation. And so I think, okay, maybe I can just kind of, um, I, I just abandon all control in general. But no, you still need to control yourself, right? But you can't control that reality. Um, you kind of get the pattern there, right? It, what people try to do in these situations is fix. And this is a negative, and I want it to go away. We, 
and it, like I said, I think universally it can take kind of all the specific ways people do this, right? So there, I get in trouble. Okay, well, let me try to lie about it, or let me try to weave the narrative in a different way. Let me appease the system and take the plea deal and then... Right? All of these things are coming out of the motivation. Maybe I still do some of those things, but they're coming out of the motivation of I'm trying to control the outcome, right? Um, uh, you know, my kid makes bad choices and things like that. Well, let me try to control their behavior. Let me fix my kid in some way. Well, definitely, I do want to assist my child as much as possible, give them the education, give them the medical resources, these types of things that they need, right? But trying to control it is it ends up producing negative effects, right? And again, it goes to that definition of the behavior. If I'm, if I'm if I'm trying to connect my child who makes a bad choice in, in their life or they're going they're going through some things and I try to connect them to helpful resources, well, that's a good thing. But if I do that because I want to control the outcomes in their life that are fundamentally theirs, well, that's a bad thing because now I'm trying to pirate their life, mm. right? So that motivation of what I'm trying to do, like the why behind my actions, that defines the action. Right? It's the difference between I'm trying to connect you with resources to help you and I'm trying to connect you with resources because you're really making me mad. I'm trying to fix the situation to fix you. Totally different reality. Same behavior, totally different reality is being brought about by it. So like I said, so kind of that what's the worst thing is trying to control the situation. Right? Now we can, like I said, we can control ourselves. And if I control me, if I make decisions out of who I am, right, and I try to bring that into the world, that's very different. I'm controlling me, and I'm going to then influence the world, and I might invite some things, but I'm not trying to control the situation in those moments, right? So again, I got my kid, and it's very clear. I'm like, okay, this really makes me, makes me sad, makes me feel a little embarrassed, but I have to, so I'm being authentic, right? But I have to put me aside because the bigger issue is just you and your ability to make your choices. So let me understand a little bit more about your choice and kind of hear you. And do you hear that your choice was wrong? Do you hear that, okay, if you don't hear it's wrong, then probably me taking you over to this source with the assumption that you think it's wrong isn't going to be helpful. I've got to actually get you to a different source so you can actually understand and really adopt why your actions are unacceptable, right? Mm. That's that's what we're talking about. I, I control me, and then I start producing a very different series of outcomes in reality. I feel like that's something that, in like Western Western ideology and philosophy itself, lacks. Mm -hmm. um, in Asian philosophy, you have like the Tao Te Ching, the Way, mm -hmm. um, which is the best way to describe it. Was an author used Winnie the Pooh as an example of a Taoist who. Regardless of the things going on, Eeyore, you know, uh, I can't remember the character's name, Tiger, Rabbit, what, whatever, whatever's going on in his life or the way, like, things are happening, he's just in the moment because that's all he can control is himself. Right. Um, although he is a little pessimist, um, oh, you know, a little pity like Eeyore, um, but yeah, I feel like we are so wanting to control stuff and that might be a huge, I know personally for me, it's, it's not worked. <laughs> uh, like it, it just, it doesn't work. You're going through something hard. You can sit there and cry and have a pity party or you can accept this is happening and move forward. Um, and you brought up something good. I know a lot of people that I've interacted and I've seen online. One of the things that, it was a hindrance to them wanting to seek out a chaplain was too many. I, I would feel like too many in the past, like you said, couldn't, couldn't set aside the religion aspect and see that there's a pluralist approach. Mm -hmm. And if you couldn't do it through your religion, then I can't help you at all, which I feel like that is a terrible way to go about things. Um, and being able to see what other resources are available. Plus, you probably work with these individuals pretty frequently, so uh, you could recommend them to a specific in person and stuff. But um, Now, let's say I'm not in the military. I work for an organization or institution that does not have a chaplain, and I'm going through something hard. 
would that advice still stand true of um and control yourself first yes yeah and that's it, it and, and so and you bring up a great point right when i talk about when i talk to folks about what's happening in their lives right somebody comes in and says hey, hey josh do you have a minute and we're talking about things one of the first things I, I i talk to folks about is let's understand you are not your situation and i help them understand what you want to control is out here and you can't control it you can control you so let's talk about how to do that and then how controlling you might influence this in some way right but that's the first thing i've got to do is, is help them understand here's you here's your world they're not the same but in living without a boundary your world has you've allowed your world to define you and that's not an accusation that is the way we train americans right we are trained from the beginning you want a happy life get good grades right you get the good grades so you can get the good job you get the good job so you can get the good paycheck you get the good paycheck so you can live a good life well what that tells me is, is that if i miss any one of those steps i can't live a good life right my world we train americans to imagine that their self-definition is entirely dependent on their circumstances not on how they are in the moment right and not who they are as an individual the things make they are the thing like yes i'm not successful unless i'm driving that cadillac suv or i'm wearing insert designer brand clothes or married to the most attractive person which is this superficial descriptions of who they are at the end of the day mm -hmm. um i saw i saw a meme it wasn't really a meme it was more like a motivational too many people waste their lives pursuing meaningless pursuits mm -hmm. just enjoy your moment you know um if you like reading books there's no shame in enjoying that aspect because what's the point of life if you do all that yes and, and that's so actually this is the um this is kind of the uh the training that i've just done for my command recently and showing them that um uh, what happens in america after americans in, in britain as well um what happens after retirement is we see mortality rates skyrocket right immediately after retirement and the reason isn't because people lose their purpose it's because they never had any purpose in the first place and so what they've done in america in, in the west in general is we've substituted work we've substituted family even for purpose for this higher definition of purpose right and i'm not saying family's not a good thing right um family's definitely a good thing and, but the the truth is is i am not my family right my emotional connections there are important my social responsibilities and obligations to assist to connect uh, and to mutually support one another very important but they are not me right i can my family can can pass away i still live i still have to have a meaning separate from the material individuals that are other than who i am right uh, but yeah, so we are very much trained in, like I said, in, in these substitutes, but then as the substitutes go away, I'm left with the question about why, why continue? And it's not just a mental, emotional thing. It's a physical thing too. The body, once it stops needing to work is like, cool, deuces, I'm done working. Right. And we see mortality, like I say, um, hit this, uh, hit this long, uh, this very strong jump, not long, sorry, very strong jump uh post retirement and i think that's that's hard a it's a tragedy for society because people with all these years of life lessons who could still have purpose and meaning and sharing those we're losing them right um but also it means that a lot of people have literally spent 75 years 78 years just doing for no other purpose than just doing right uh, which means to your point of the kind of the um, that motivational uh, meme that you saw right those these meaningless purposes most of us are doing a lot of purposes with now without a larger meaning than just to do them so i can live and then i just live so that i can do them and that is just a circle of meaninglessness i feel like the way western society has become is so materialistic that that pursuit is why we're having so many issues um plus society itself is soft in the aspect of things have been real easy when war is breaking out it's in 
certain locations. It's not affecting everybody. You mm -hmm. know, you don't have Genghis Khan coming through and wiping out literally a quarter or more of humanity. Um, it's very isolated. You know, I'm not in Ukraine right now, so my life is good. I'm not. I'm not in. Um, you know, South China Sea right now dealing with some dictator. Life is good. I'm not. You know, I'm not there, so it it, it doesn't affect me. And I'm just going to do this because, you know, that. And then at the end of the day, when that is over, it's really hard. I know for law enforcement, military, and, and any job that is like adrenaline producing, they have a huge issue with mortality rate because once that adrenaline fix is gone, the body, like you said, is like, oh, well, I've done my job. Um, and I've seen that. We also are in Okinawa right now, which is a blue zone. And yesterday I was on a tour and you wouldn't be able to tell, but she was a child survivor of the battle of Okinawa. Um, she was joking that she was 48 plus 30. Um, that, how lively she is now compare that to somebody in America having worked in nursing homes, that activity plays an important part. And I feel like the reason why in Asia specifically you see a lot more elderly out and about is because they haven't defined their life as a pursuit of I'm insert X. Right. They have I'm and then I do X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's what makes them more successful. Um, yes. Yeah. I mean, in, because... Relative poverty really shows us this, right? And we think about how sad we are when, when our, our income dips below, pick whatever threshold with, with five digits you want, right? But then we go to third world countries and uh, there are people in what we would consider abject poverty just consider that normal, right? Their perspective of what poverty is is very different from ours. And so this is where we're talking about absolute poverty versus relative poverty. Relative poverty tells us that I have the power to define when I'm really poor, right? My circumstances don't, I do. But again, we abdicate that to the larger culture and our larger Western culture is very affluent. So our threshold for poverty is, is very, very high, high right? Um, Where again, in other countries, that's not so much the case. So that shows us that our circumstances and, and how we're doing actually don't define us. So and the other, point with that too is is when I look around and everybody's living in the same same circumstances I don't consider that abnormal right but if we're if we approach absolute poverty where we look at people are with at a large scale people are legitimately worried about their next meal these basic survival needs right that's what we're talking about absolute poverty those moments well when a lot of people are like that around me and that's normal right I start to accept that suffering is part of life but I also accept that it's still not okay. And so you see larger community connections, more people willing to share. Uh, when I was in Salt Lake, uh, we lived in Salt Lake and, and um, I bust down to, uh, to Provo. Uh, when you get on the, at least when I was there, uh, and you get on those buses and you walk around kind of that 4th Avenue and uh, area, or not 4th Avenue, sorry, uh, kind of that 4th West area there, um, it's spend time, you, watching populations you watch the homeless right and you watch how much of a sense of community homeless folks have because they accept our life right now our mutual life is suffering and so when i get a little bit more i share it right with the understanding that as part of being community you're going to share with me and it's actually really magical to watch people who have the least in a population being sometimes the most generous Right. So when you talk about materialistic, right, I, I, I want to take, a, take just a slight, a slight turn on materialistic. We're materialistic with an end towards consumption, right? I don't think there's a problem necessarily with being materialistic and thinking, okay, I, we need materials to, to, to survive. It's the what do I do with it, right? Um, again, in, in, in communities and cultures that are closer to a, absolute poverty, you see a general sense of we do need to pursue material ends because we gotta live right but it's not for me it's for us there's still a materialistic aspect but it's not for consumption it's for sharing and for community 
as well. But yes, in Affluent West, I, it's my stuff, right? It's my capital. Yeah. It's, it's mine. My five-bedroom home, my three-car garage, my boat, my the, the chasing the Joneses mm -hmm. aspect of life. And that's why I feel like it's a very complicated subject. I feel like the suicide issue with modern society, I think right now we're seeing that because of these lacks of outside motivators, this lack of community involvement, mm -hmm. um, this lack of being well balanced. Uh, the Air Force, I've enjoyed it and I think it's meaningful, but they say there's four pillars of being a successful person. That's mental resiliency, spiritual resiliency, physical resiliency, and social resiliency. Um, they're basically four legs of a chair. If you're not strong, you're going to have issues. If you don't have a social group, friends, family, connections, you're not going to do well. You can get away with working on three legs, but eventually those legs are going to wear out because you've been rocking on them so, and you're going to collapse. You have to build um, collectively and develop and work on these skills together. And I noticed that personally for me in my life when I've struggled, it's because one of those pillars or multiple pillars were all out of whack. Mm. Or I was trying to substitute it with something that wasn't as viable. Like, oh, I replaced the leg on there not knowing that it had worm rot through it, you know. <laughs> um, and having dealt with hard depression, suicidal ideation, I have my own musings on the topic. But I feel like Western society isn't helping in that regard, too, because we're so driven by you've got to be a consu consumerism is a huge issue. And when you pull that consumerism out, what is a person? And so when something bad does happen, my wife leaves me, my f family has issues or I got caught doing something and I've got shame from it or insert whatever the issue is or. I have friends that are doing it now, so I think, oh, maybe I'll do it too. Um, I know that that was a huge issue with uh, um, Iraq veterans, you know. Um, is being more spiritually rounded and pluralistic a good starting point to alleviate those issues or those tendencies? Um, or is it just so complicated there's no really good way to go about it? <laughs> Okay, so, uh, all right, so when you're talking about a human trend, and especially one that is, is increasingly pervasive, the suicide is, the easy answer is to say it's, it's just too big, right? Um, we can look at it and say, okay, this is part of culture, right? Uh, and say, well, I can't, we can't change culture. The Air Force, the Navy, we're, whoever it is, we're not going to change culture. And to a certain degree, you're right. We're not going to change 7 billion people out of an organization of a, a few hundred thousand, right? Um, that's tr That aspect of it is true. But then we kind of, what about looking towards spirituality for it? That's where I think it gets a little bit more complicated. So it's probably worth a take, moment to take a step back and define spirituality a little bit more concretely, right? Than just in terms of its relationship with religion. Um, and when you do that, and when you ask, okay, what's your definition, what's the definition of spirituality? It's broad. Like the, the, the catalog of options that you have to choose from for your definition of spirituality is really big, right? If I ask somebody from one of the Eastern philosophies, uh, they're going to look at something that is going to be largely about a connection with ultimate reality, right? It's not going to be about God or religion. It's going to be how am I connected to reality? You brought up the Tao, right? Hinduism, Buddhism, they're still going to con all connect to, am I connected with reality as it is, right? Um, in the West, we would, Stoicism, and I'm talking classical Stoicism, not the, oh, I don't care about things, Stoic perspective that we usually talk about, but classic Stoic, classical Stoicism talks about really focusing on just accept that the way reality is, is how it is, and you need to find your place and connection in that. All right, so we've got those resources in the West. Um, if I talk to a Christian, they're going to talk to me about spirituality as being how am I 
connected with Jesus, right? And more the evangelical side, it, you know, is Jesus my personal Lord and Savior? And it's going to be very, very much about that moment of confession of Christ and acceptance of grace, those types of aspects. If I talk to a Latter-day Saint about it, it's going to, about spirituality, they're going to talk about, are we doing our private and our family worship practices? Am I reading my scriptures? Am I saying my prayers? These types of things, right? So a lot of religious behavior there. If I talk to somebody who's in the counseling field, right? So my therapist, my psychologist, those types of things, and I have them about spirituality, they're going to talk about, do I feel, how am I feeling as far as my own sense of self? Right, and, and the, these types of things. Um, some of our more therapeutic side of things, especially relationship, they're going to talk about spirituality. I'm thinking of Brene Brown now. How well am I connected with the people around me? Right. And so you see a lot of these different ends that people are talking about, but the theme is they're connection. It. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the theme that goes throughout is, is this issue of connection. So when I talk about spirituality to folks, I, I talk about there's four different aspects. Um, of spirituality and they, they all apply they all have meaning but to be a fully like be a truly spiritual a completely spiritual person it would require integrity throughout all of them and that that's actually my key word that i think about is, is spirituality is integrity it's that connectedness an architectural perspective of integrity do are my pieces all fitting together and are they performing the function and working with the reality around me right so my integrity has to be between my mental, emotional, my ethical, my physical, and my social self, those, those aspects of me that I can see, are they all connected, right? Uh, there's a great song, um, uh, Dirk Bentley song, um, I know what I was feeling, but what was I thinking, right? So that's a really good example of a, a space where in some aspect of me, there's a disintegrity, right? I have these feelings, I really want this thing, but it violates what I know is a smart decision, right? And so the lack of integrity there, that's going to be a point at which spirituality can provide a, a reason to bring those in line and a framework about which one that conflict should win, right? Uh, we talk about sleep discipline and the effect that it has on mental health, right? That's where my body and my mental sides have to come together and be in integrity with each other, right? But again, spirituality provides that framework to create that. So that's within me. That's the first division is, do I have integrity within the parts of me that I can see? The next one is going to be, do I have integrity with reality around me, right? Again, so if I have, an, I have a building and it's in California or here in Japan, it needs to be earthquake-proofed, right? Because that's part of the reality that I live in. My building has to be able to accept reality as it is. So when I'm looking at that, do I actually accept the fact that everybody I know and love, either before or after me, will die? Right? That's one of the foundational reality questions that, that we have to accept is that death is a part of life. Right? And if, but in the West, we live like death is this weird thing we don't see coming. Like, it's universal, guys. Like the 99-year-old queen. Oh, no, she died. Like Exactly. Right? Everyone's like, oh, this is... So, I did not see that happening. Right. It, it, now, admittedly, it's a loss, right? There's a human. Yeah. She's done a great contribution. All of that is true, mm. but it's not a surprise. It's not a, it's not the worst case scenario, unless we want to live with a, unless we want to live in a reality that says the thing that is universal and definitely going to happen is the worst thing that could happen. Right? If that's our logic, that's a really depressing place to live. Right? Yeah. So that's the second place is, am I accepting reality as a, and am I, sorry, am I integral? with reality actually as it actually is right so i've got integrity within myself or integrity with reality around me um this is part of that control aspect you mind if we pause real quick Let's take a pause. it'll keep recording uh, yeah. let's see if the bathroom no, no, no. go ahead yeah. 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 all right you know me <laughs> i listened to it anyway just before um try to edit so you got okay so again just coming back to the topic of you have four ideas of there's four aspects yeah of it so you got these two that we can see right again my, myself and the aspects of myself reality um around me that i work with but then we talk about kind of two transcendent poles as well um one is this deeper sense of 
who I am, right? This, um, the, the truly subjective self, that part of me that lies really, really deep within, right? So when we talk about people having intrusive thoughts or depressive feelings, right? I talk to them, I talk to them about kind of, you feel that there's a thought, right? But then you feel that there, that thought is happening to you. And so you can kind of experience where that feeling, there's you, this core of you, and you feel that emotion happening to you. Or on the positive side, you feel love, right? We're talking about, I fell in love, right? So there's clearly this distinction between the me that I experience as an objective self, and then that me that I experience as a subjective self, that deeper self, right? So we want to have integrity there to that, that transcendent self, that, that deeper self. Is that actually connected with the choices that I'm living through also? And then finally, we talked about, con in spirituality, we talked about connection to something transcendent, right? For religious folks, that's going to be connection with God, right? For folks that are not religious, it's going to be connection with some ultimate, some, or at least higher, right? So even for atheists, this is where a lot of the conversation on spirituality, I think, leaves atheists out in the cold in a big way because I'm not saying that they necessarily have faith in some reality that has a material uh, purpose, but it doesn't mean that as an atheist I can't define myself by higher set of principles, right? That I can't say I'm, I know it's not real, I don't believe in it, but I feel connected with a sense of justice in the world. And so that's kind of that ideal that I, it's a transcendent principle, right, that I can connect with and have it draw out of me the behaviors or the lifestyle or the identity that I feel most closely connected with, right? And so, yeah, it's kind of how I do this, kind of this connected, imminent connection within myself, this connection with reality, and then this transcendent, higher and deeper aspect of, of spirituality. It's a, I really like that. I'm probably, I'm a hundred percent, hundred percent telling you now I'm stealing that. No, easy day. Easy day. Um, I remember a couple years ago, I was on a social media site and this, I was just up at a random time back in the States and it was like probably 2 AM, 3 AM and a guy randomly messaged, I think I'm going to kill myself guys. And I was just like. Hmm, that's not cool. So I just started talking to him, and what I found was he was just lonely. And I asked, how are you trying to f do this? And he said, basically, I can't make friends. I can't find friends that have common interests. Or if I do, like, they don't care. Like, I'm just the guy that's there at whatever the event is. They don't associate with me beyond beyond that. And I said, have you tried to do stuff that you like to find people that have commonalities that would be open to that? Because I 100% guarantee if you start, for instance, going to poker night, you're going to have like-minded people that are going to be asking, hey, man, are you coming to poker night this week? And now you have a social connection. Um, I said, tell you what, there's a Home Depot near you and they do classes on Saturday. You should probably go to those classes. And if you're lucky, maybe you find a, a single woman that's there doing another class to have that aspect because they also were talking about that. I completely forgot that I ever did that. I got a private message probably like a year and a half. So thank you. Um, I feel like that ties into that connection because that person was basing their entire reality off of that objective I am X, Y, and Z, neglecting and then that subjective part of... I would say in psychology or sociology, you would say that's the id of you, um, your culminating experiences as an individual, um, maybe too overpowering because you've been stuffing in all these things that at the end of the day are utterly meaningless because they don't, not that reading books and doing things isn't purposeful but they're not connecting the dots in that spirituality and they're not tying to 
a higher power of some purpose or drive. Right. And it, it, and I think like your your advice your to to your friend here was essential and and it really was spiritual, right? It's very practical. But notice the avenue. I'm not getting friends. I keep doing this because I want to. Again, going back to our earlier conversation, I want to control reality. I want to do behavior X, and then it will produce this response in other people. They will start to be my friends. So I'm going to these parties to make people my friends, right? And it's very alienating internally. I'm doing this thing that I'm not comfortable with. I, I'm trying to have these conversations that are awkward. I don't really know anything about. And so, A, the attempt to control is failing, so that's disappointing. But B, I've got this inauthenticity, this disintegrity within myself because I'm faking it, right? But then you look at your advice, right? We'll start with the things that you like and just go to, and start doing it in social places. Now, that's where I take me and my interests, right? N not my deeper self necessarily, but I take kind of me, the things that I know about me as an object. I like doing this behavior. And now I'm just going to make a choice about where I do it. I'm still, now I increase my own authenticity, I increase my own integrity, and I'm connecting with reality. And the reality is, is that I could do this by myself and be alone, but I really want to be around people, so I do it around people. And now I'm building connections with other people that are like mine. I'm not controlling it, I just control myself in a way that invites a different reality in that moment. That is all about integrity, kind of on those aspects, um, in those two different aspects, internally and then externally, from all around me, right? That's that's a, an aspect. It's not religious, right? It's not connecting me necessarily to a higher thing, but it is connecting me with reality largely around me. And I'm, again, I'm not trying to lie to myself and say that I can control it, but I can control me. That's where we're talking about, you know, the, the, the earlier question that kind of led into this segment of the conversation about spirit, it's about suicide, right? If we can start helping people really feel empowered to control what they can control, to have integrity that's within themselves, and then to live with reality as it actually is, yeah, we start to mitigate some of the things that we see leading into suicide. Uh, there is a comic um, <clears throat> by... Uh, called the Watchmen, and in there, this is a little um, really dark joke, but it, 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 I feel like it's crucial, and I've told it on this podcast before. But there's a professional clown, and he's not feeling well. He, you know, he just feels like he could have been better. Um, his life's not gone the way he's wanted it, um, and so he just wants to go to the doctor. You know, talk to the doctor. So he goes to the doctor. Basically, you know, gives his soft story, his pity party. And the doctor laughs and goes, tell you what, I'm going to write you a prescription. There's a great, there's a great clown in town. You should go see him. And he goes, the problem is I'm the clown. Um, to use a real world example, Robin Williams done a great amount of good subject, subjectively, you know, people think he's a terrible person or whatever, but he's done a lot of good. He was involved in my childhood, basically through voicing different characters, different movies and stuff. But at the end of the day, there was something, I feel like there was so much subjective, I am Robin Williams, that subjective, and then the connection to higher power, um, it's hard to say because we don't know what his thoughts were, but it's easy, it's always easier to look on the outside. Um, co what is it, they call it, coach the field, you know, you, you, you can coach from the sidelines all the, all the time, it's real easy, but you, unless you're on there, you don't see it. Um, so, it, and I think it's important to notice, and I want to emphasize the point, is that when we're talking about spirituality it, and what it can do for suicide, it can mitigate, right? When we're looking at, um, when we're looking at issues where mental health plays into the situation, right? That does take a different turn for things. Um, and so, and I think that's part of the, part of the conversation uh, around suicide is, is, I don't want to look at somebody who's going through something, um, going through a mental health challenge right in in their life and say well you just need to pray your way out of it 
right? It doesn't work that way. Spirituality, again, if we take spirituality as this idea of integrity, especially with reality and my own reality, um, that's an important kind of caveat that, that we look at. It. Spirituality, if I, if I look at my life and I say, wait, I'm feeling very depressed right now. I've got these very depressive symptoms. I probably need to go and talk to somebody and find out what's going on, right? That's, that's living in integrity with my mental health. I need to look at the situation and look at the, ex let's talk about the external factor, right? So the, the recent loss and the piling up of bills and the career disappointment that are all happening, those are the externals, right? And I look at that and I think, I'm having very depressive emotions right now. My thoughts are not very clear. I probably need to go and talk to somebody. That's where spirituality, like I said, just mitigates it. I'm, ha I'm, being, I'm being honest with what's happening inside of me in that moment, right? And so I'm going to then go somewhere to have those mental health symptoms diagnosed, right? Let's see if this is just kind of a depressive episode, if this is symptoms of major depressive disorder. I'm actually gonna get connected with that. Spirituality is gonna help me accept that the mental is part of who I am. It doesn't mean, like I said, it doesn't mean that I can just pray away my mental health issues, right? You can't, I tell people all the time, it's not take two prayers and call me in the morning, right? Mental health is, 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 part, of, is part of that life. It's not part of my deeper inner who I am ultimately. It's part of that, that objective self that I can see, but I still have to live in, and accept that that's part of who I am. So if I've got major depressive disorder, I go somewhere and I actually get depressed, I get uh, diagnosed with that right, in that moment, I need to accept that that's part of that situation right now. And that getting better in my life or living authentic doesn't mean I'm gonna act like now I'm bad. You're not bad because you have major depressive disorders. It's like you're not bad because you've got a scratch in your knee. Right? Yeah. That's where we're talking about spirituality helps mitigate these things. It doesn't fix it, but it helps me kind of, again, control what I can't control, accept what I can't accept, and live in, live in connection with that. So I just want to be kind of clear about yeah. it and really make sure that that part is, is emphasized. There's a lot of folks that hear, well, spirituality can help with these things, and imagine that it's, oh, I can just fix my problems. Not to say that miracles can't happen, right. but if we're looking for a sign, we're not going to see it. There's a reason why there are miracles and not magic. Exactly. Magic is where I take something that is unknown and I use it to control it in an unexpected way, right? That and the whole idea there is, is I now can control reality outside of what normally should be expected. Well, no, you can't expect to control the unexpected, right? But mir yes, miracles definitely do happen. I feel like in that respect, people are like trying to look for a save me moment. Mm -hmm. It doesn't come because at the end of the day, how eventually it's going to come back. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of like that old joke where the, the water's rising and the guy's like, you know, God, please, um, please save me. And a guy comes by in a truck and he's like, jump in. He's like, no, no, God's going to save me. And eventually he's up on his roof and asking for help. And a helicopter comes by and he says, no, no, God's going to save me. Well, wasn't that the truck, the guy in the boat, the guy in the plane, or the helicopter, rather, um, were looking for this. I, I like that because it's also a religious person, you know, mm -hmm. missing the mark. Um, I also feel another aspect is people don't talk to themselves in the right way. Uh, we don't, we're so, Western society drives this, idea of you are who you of what you own mm -hmm. it doesn't give back you have to look for outward praise like i have to get a certificate of achievement i have to win x y and z i have to get this promotion because i am a good person in it and then when that doesn't happen they're in a situation where they've built it's like affirming a dog's behavior off of treats. When you don't have treats, what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. And we've done that to ourselves where we're like Pavlov's dog. We're only salivating at success. So when there's no success, we're starving, but we're still salivating. Mm -hmm. We've not fixed anything. 
Um, I was working with one of the bases psychologists during a hard time in my life. And he's like, you are a pessimist, but we can change that. And I feel like in the last four or five years, I've really have come leaps and bounds and it's taken work and it's not been an overnight thing. Right. And it's silly, but something that really helped was I was seeking so much outside, um, um, a praise that when I wasn't getting it, I felt like I wasn't, I wasn't worth a person. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I started every morning, um, telling myself, I love you in the mirror. And that really helped. And so I've actually advised other people to do that because at the end of the day, if you don't love yourself, other people can't. And there's a lot of, there's a, um, Keanu Reeves is basically famous for if you can't be happy single, how can you be happy together? Because then you're just using that other person as a crutch to fix your internal, like what we've been talking about, these pillars of spirituality, connection, and religion. Mm -hmm. If we're not, if we're not checking the box, we're not filling it, then how can we expect somebody else to do that? And eventually they're going to go away and, and then we're still left with staring in the mirror do you like you as a person and how do you deal with that uh recently we we're doing the uh, mission prep class and it's really weird i never thought i would be doing that <laughs> um but i was just so dang jealous throughout the entire time um i would go serve a single mission if i could or and i, I hope to do a elderly mission uh, service mission um so i was really excited and i was thinking what advice would i want the 20 year old me who went on a mission to know. And I was very candid that one of the things that a lot of missionaries experience, and I've seen it online reaffirmed is post mission depression mm -hmm. because throughout the mission, did, when you were on a mission, did you have people, Oh, I'm going to do this when I go home. Right. Oh yeah. And it's interesting now to look back to see, where we've been mm -hmm. and what we've done and mainly what we've not done. <laughs> and for me, what I've not done had become so much of that abject appraisal, that outside appraisal. Oh, I didn't go to BYU. So I'm not a good member of the church. Um, you know, I didn't, I didn't do this. I didn't, I didn't do that. I'm not a good member. And so, I really wanted to let them know you guys need to work on who you are, your driving mechanism, because it's going to be hard when you go on a mission and it's going to be hard when you get back, mm -hmm. especially when things don't go the way you want it. And I've seen that with my friends and family and other people have gone. And we talk about the conversation in the church, especially is very much uh, one of do righteous things and you get rewards, you get tangible rewards, right? Um, I am so grateful that I don't hear and have actively heard against, um, you know, the, we'll go serve an honorable mission so that you can come back and have a righteous spouse, have an attractor, whatever it is, right? Somehow your mission determines the qual some quality basis of your spouse, right? As if any of that is a direct result, right? That, that righteous living produces protection against bad things or that it produces good things in your yeah, so helping helping the youth understand that you're going to serve full stop, right? You are going to on a mission to serve. That's what it's about, right? And yeah, you grow, that that's good, but if I go on a mission in order to grow, that's gonna get in the way of me serving. But if I grow on a mission to serve, that's going to necessarily create growth, right? Um, so in helping, yeah, I, I think, I think that's a, I mean, a huge thing is to help, help them understand that if they have the right focus and intent as they're heading into their missions, it will produce the results and the right focus is don't care about the results, right? And separate yourself from them. And then that again, won't fix, but hopefully would mitigate some of that, that post-mission depression when life doesn't turn out rosy like you hoped it would.
and you mentioned something like even on the mission i had a little depression because i wasn't checking i wasn't meeting the same box as everyone else was and it, it was very hard to deal with that because then i was tying my success as a missionary to these external factors that really at the end of the day don't really matter because just because i'm not baptizing doesn't mean i'm not successful as a missionary and even if i have baptized it doesn't mean i'm still successful as a missionary mm -hmm. so um yeah i, I really pl plus 100 percent. i really hope they all serve because they were wonderful um smarter than i was at that age um i don't i never even did a mission prep class i just i was like hey bishop uh, a homeless guy told me on a train i needed to serve a mission so i i, I want to do that <laughs> um and did the papers and then I got got my mission. Um, it wasn't Europe like I was hoping for, and that was a little hard. So it's like learning not to make your happiness be an outside reward is really hard because a consumeristic society drives you to you have to do this and be happy. And um, I had a mission companion that had the same watch he had since he was like ten years old. He said, anytime I think about going and buying another watch and looking at another nice watch, I go, that's a nice watch, but the one I have works. Yeah. My brother, so I, I kind of on the, on this topic, right? My brother uh, served his mission in Madrid, uh, which was really awesome. Was great. And kind of hearing the stories from him, he's, he's older than I am. Um, we overlapped our missions, though. So he had served probably about a year of his mission when I got my call around about that. Uh, maybe more, maybe about 18 months at that point. We're hearing all these great stories about life in Madrid and how exciting it was. It was great, right? And I get my call, and I was raised by a single mom. We were out in the woods, so it was just us, right? But my mom's videoing it, and I open the letter, and says, you know, all this stuff, and I'm looking for the city, and it's California Fresno, right? And there's that moment where I'm like, ugh, and then there's that second thought, oh, crap, I'm on camera. <laughs> <laughs> right, so I'm like Fresno and I'm like trying to pump it up as much as I can and all my friends knew that I was going to it was there was a youth activity afterwards all my friends knew that I was opening up my mission paper um and so I've got to go see all these people and fake like I'm happy about Fresno right and I I knew what California was we grew up on the east coast I knew what California was I had no idea what Fresno was I had nothing you get out there and Fresno is just desert that's been fertilized really well right and just it's it's a place in and of itself it's not very attractive or anything like that and I had to really struggle with kind of accepting no 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 this is where my blessings are I wanted them somewhere else I wanted the fancy mission but my blessings were not there they were here like somewhere else they were here that's where they actually were and now it was up to me to find them and or create them right in that space uh but that was a really uh, like i said it was a really hard lesson to, to stop expecting that that this external thing would actually bring me the happiness and really kind of get that it was on me to figure it out and yeah i went through the same things right the, I, I got talked up, um, like I had a person who's like, I had a dream you're going to the Belgian mission and um, and then that happened within the stake and then I, I'm opening the call and I see Birmingham, Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> um, for a long time, I, I, I didn't like the mission while being on the mission and it wasn't until the very last transfer that I started to see um, things that made it to where I didn't regret because the entire time I, I regretted being a missionary and it was really hard to, to deal with that because I was tying so much of my success as to am I leading people into the church right. through how many prayers are you doing a week? How many people are you asking to commit to come to church? Are they committing to baptism? Are they getting the district interview? Are they doing it now? Are they going to the temple? Um, are they getting see like all these things? And when it wasn't happening and I've, been trained or i've not been trained but i trained myself to think my success and my worthiness as a missionary is inherently in these things um and the irony is i went through that lesson but i didn't learn it <laughs> <laughs> um and the again that base psychologist that pointed out my pessimism he said i want you to start writing down optimistic things hmm. i don't care how you're feeling that day 
you're going to write down something good or something you liked. Um, and it's really hard to look, you know, that the dumb analogy of the glass half full or half empty um, to start thinking, oh, maybe it's actually three quarters. Um, he said, you know, he used an alcohol an alcoholic you know thing he said you never drink a full uh, a full glass of scotch um and members of the church won't get that but right. you're not gonna you're not gonna <laughs> drink a ton of alcohol right. you're gonna sip what you have and enjoy it and that comes through savoring it right um are you savoring your moments are you enjoying the moments or are you just throwing a pity party mm -hmm. um we love throwing pity parties. I feel like that's what a lot of people have in those hard moments. Um, and I think it's important here kind of to note this, right? Th this aspect of savoring is actually required in order to get connected with reality. The brain is designed, our brains are designed to give more emphasis, electricity, chemical energy towards a negative, right? That's part of how we've ended up where we are in the food chain as, as an animal is, is we're the most scared and the most anxious, right? Probably not the most, but you kind of get what we're saying. Yeah. We're fo our brains are focused on negative because it gets us away from danger and it, get, and it encourages us to use efficiencies to make decisions that help us get to safety, right? Or in the cases where we can to overpower the negative and to control it, right? What that means, though, is that if reality is not, if I'm embracing reality, right, I'm walking out into reality, it means that my brain is actually tuned to not see reality as it is. Our brains are wired to be pessimistic, right, and to see the world as a continued, like, to emphasize the threats in the world. And what we know is, is we talk about meditation, we talk about the, these things. I know that I need to give at least 15 seconds of attention to a positive thing in order to actually get and that's kind of the minimum there of concentrated focus on the thing to actually appreciate it as it really is right um and so we're talking about savoring the scotch or savoring what it is yes these moments of like experiencing uh, you know i don't know how much work you've done with meditation but the classic raise in meditation where i've got this thing it's raising it's mundane it's common but when I take it and I spend a few seconds running, a, you know, looking at it, really paying attention to the contours, the wrinkles, right? I roll it around in my fingers and feel how those various wrinkles feel. Feel how tender and juicy this reason is vice the dry, really dry one. And kind of really experience that reality and concentrate on it. Pop it in the mouth, savor it. Um, appreciate the flavors that it ha instead of just throwing it in and chewing up and swallowing it, right? Uh, when we do that, we give our brains the time to actually process reality as it really is and to appreciate the positives. I think they call that presence. There's um there's a book I think I would if you haven't read it, I highly suggest it and I've I think I brought it up before, but it's by a um, a chiropractor, Dr. Joe Dispenza, and it's called Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself. Hmm. Um, he basically goes over we all know that per the he uses an example of the woman that's always in an abusive relationship she has inconveniently put herself in these positions to where no matter what relationship she's going to be in she's going to magically find the person that's going to be abusive to her because that is how she's driven her self-value um, you're not getting your promotion at work because you're not thinking about it you're not being present in the moment of thinking how do i achieve that he he, he kind of has like some wonky spiritualism in there but it, he does offer some points and one of those that I just think about is um, that brain chemistry, we have neurons, which basically is the infrastructure of the brain. Mm -hmm. When we do things, those neurons light up and they start walking around carrying proteins and doing a whole bunch of chemical reactions. And when you repeat an action, those chemical neurons are like, oh, I remember this. Um, so for example, I get up every day, I repeat the same actions. If you do those same actions, you're going to build and that becomes a habit. And so what a lot of people have done is they've created terrible habits because, and it becomes a default mechanism. Like you said, we're so built on negativism. It's so much easier for me to go time to be sad. Mm -hmm. um, 
where you can't savor that moment you can't enjoy that chocolate because you're like my day has been terrible um and so that we've sort of been pavloved ourselves into a scenario that we can't escape from without hard work um yeah i really enjoyed that book mm -hmm. um i think it's like 300 pages and he has some like interesting things that kind of get out there that kind of chiropractor again um but he gets paid to speak a lot of people like his stuff and <laughs> um i i found it useful in application uh again like going and giving myself words of affirmation this seems silly but it worked mm -hmm. um well, this is where we talk about kind of building those building patterns um i think there's a part of there there's a part of it where our brain really resonates with truth especially when we're challenging you know, when we're challenging some of these assumptions that we have our brain's going to resonate more with with true things so the affirm if we're picking aphorisms or we're trying to find these ways to talk to ourselves we need to actually find ones that our brain is not going to immediately reject right? <laughs> like stop it that's yeah. nonsense well yeah because our, our brain very much will right that's one of the beauties of a forest gump um the kind of the, that movie there is the movie's culminating and he's coming kind of face to face with his son right and he's it you see kind of for the first moment Forrest really kind of embracing and acknowledging the fact that he's not smart right and because you've heard it right i may not be a smart man throughout the movie you've heard that but you really see him confront and say no i understand the weight of what my reality is in that moment right so forrest gump to look in a mirror and say every morning i am smart you know that that is an aphorism that will not resonate with him because his brain will see the falsehood of the statement right now that doesn't mean though that forrest gump couldn't come up with an aphorism that said something along the lines of i have worth or my words still have impact and value right now that may be something that somebody who's struggling with inferiority process right i don't you don't want to look in the mirror and say okay well i'm dumb embrace it right um but looking in the mirror and recognizing that you're not a smart man and saying i'm smart that's not going to work either and it's not going to be helpful but embracing it and saying something that does connect with with reality and re connects in a way that challenges you right that's where we definitely want to kind of align those things up you said that and i can't remember the name of the movie it was produced in the 80s it's about um the five cow johnny lingo johnny lingo mm -hmm. so for those who haven't seen it um this girl growing up her whole life on this small island has just been made fun of for her looks uh and in their culture you know the man proposes to the father i would like to marry your daughter and will give the father a certain amount of animals and everyone would say that she's a one cow wife or two cow wife and one day this man shows up sees her and says um to the father you know the father himself is also expecting you know i'm probably going to get a goat out of this um really terrible person but eventually the man goes 10 cows and everyone is just like what 10 cows it's crazy uh and then flash forward she comes back to the island and she's a hundred percent different person because when she was traveling around to those different islands when the conversation came up oh how many cows are you and she said 10 she was driving it so there are i feel like if you are self-aware and you're dealing well it's also incumbent on us to seek providing good affirmations to other people ourselves like oh i like your work in in showing that recognition because they could be a two cow but in reality they're they're actually 10 and they just not valued their self-worth as as much and so that's something i've been trying to work on especially as like a non-commissioned officer it's my duty to mentor and, and to peer um and to be involved with the the junior enlisted if not if i'm not providing the affirmation as a super if their supervisor isn't i better be providing that affirmation and positive feedback for them because in my mind if i'm not doing it then i don't know if they are getting it at all and then they've been in the situation i've been in the military and not respected for four years so i'm just going to get out um 
and then they're going to go to another job and then they're definitely not going to get that in the corporate world a hundred percent so um learning to i feel like that's what christ meant by being meek hmm. um maybe i'm using the wrong word but i feel like meekness is kind of like the closest uh idea right action so right it, yeah when when we're trying to help folks again and, and part of this we're talking about being present right um one of the risks always with with presence when we talk about kind of uh, accepting reality as it is is we can very much get stuck and, and focus on uh, a static moment and we end up projecting the fact that we're dynamic right and so we look at um, a lot of the work in education has bled over into into leadership um, but the difference between a fixed mindset and a growth mindset right if I look at it and I sit in part of accepting where I am and saying again I'll use the forest moment right is okay I'm not smart that was his way of formulating I know that there are limits to what I can do that is actually essential, right? Accepting that we are, when people say you can be anything, well, no, in point of fact, I can't be anything, right? I will not be the president of France, right? Yeah. I, that's not gonna happen. That, and, and that's that's an essential kind of accept that, that that is definitely true, right? Now, can I learn French? Can I do these things, right? That becomes an important thing. So. One of the also when you're talking about kind of being mindful and being present, but also kind of working to grow and develop, getting out of the what called fixed mindset into a growth mindset. One of the values to doing that also is to say things like, I can work hard, right? So maybe it's not an I am statement. I can. But statements about I can. And then we're, again, we're being very honest about what I can do, right? I can learn 10 French words today, right? Or I can positively influence somebody's life today i can be a value in this sphere right um again we'll get back to the mission set and, and statistics right this is one of the things that missionaries have struggled with uh i, I think since we invented statistics and I mean, missionaries and brought them together um is how do you do the statistics i was grateful that i was really grateful that i was on uh, my mission we focused on the statistics about what we could do and then we left the statistics that dealt with our investigators' reactions to it on a separate, kind of in a separate reality, right? So we were very much focused on how many hours were we out. And it was just, and it was, if that was the particular focus that we kind of worked on and we wanted to really do, then that was it, right? And if it was how many, how many people did we contact, right? Well, I can control that. I can't control how many people are gonna say yes and invite me over right I, I can't control that aspect because it's not there but i can do that and and that's where both for the aphorisms and kind of development there and also for goal setting as we're in january and everybody's worried about it really looking at what i can do allows me a growth mindset because i started to set the, the kind of that baseline and say i can do this right now and i do x for y minutes Right. And then I realized, well, I could probably pump in one or two more X's in the same amount of time. Or I look at it and say, I can do more time doing that. And I start to really see where I can grow. Right. But I'm not coming up with this off the wall goal that's completely outside of my reach. Right. And I feel like that's when no matter who you are in like that, that joke from that comic book, um, go to a comedian, go, go and do these things. Um, you do have to seek out professional help at some time. Um, and there's been a lot of, I feel like there, the, the idea of mental health awareness has really come a long way. A lot of people think it's uh, hoking that non nonsense, but, um, if somebody is hesitating whether or not they should reach out, do you think if they're thinking they should, if you think you should, you should go do it? Yeah. Okay. I mean, that's that's always the um the answer right your in your your initial instincts to to get help um or to do something that is positive go with that right um then notice what i said there your initial instinct to do something positive not your initial positive. instinct to control something yeah. right or to do something negative right but your initial instinct to do something positive go with that that's 
that that's probably I won't say that only, but that's probably your better self um, leading you into into the right direction, right? Um, if your initial instinct is to run and hide, right, that's not necessarily a positive thing, right? And sinking into yourself and these types of things, not a positive thing. It's not going to help the situation, and it's not going to produce help within yourself, right? Um, so yeah. Yeah, really, hey, I have a problem. I probably should talk to somebody. It's a lot easier to, you know, call the plumber before the basement's filled with water <laughs> than after because now you're going to have to pay to get the water, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And we're also stubborn, um, and we don't don't want to do it. Um, I had somebody very close to me that said, you probably you need to go talk to somebody. Um, so if somebody's – if you think it and if somebody else says it, you definitely need to go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so yesterday I was doing a hiking and I ended up busting my knee, um, getting it split open. And one of um, one of my two two people basically commented, um, "If you think you need stitches, you need stitches." And I feel like if you need the help, you should go get help because what you're doing isn't working. And maybe that perspective that they could offer, and if they can't, they likely know somebody who can, mm -hmm. which. I feel like my perspective now, I hear a lot more people talking to the Air Force chaplains and um, that connectedness. Um, I know an individual that went to go see the chaplain and then the chaplain was like, nah, you need to go talk to the behavioral health specialist. Um, or, you know what? Um, I really liked the idea of empowerment that maybe maybe instead of talking to somebody you need to go do something and so i've i've actually heard the case of an individual being told to here's this volunteer thing i want you to go to mm -hmm. let me know about it um i feel like that's something we can offer like when i suggest that man to go do something yeah um sometimes people just need to do something to get out of it like go do a beach cleanup or go help at your local ymca because what you're not doing is that entire time is thinking about all the bad things that are going on. You're being present in the moment. Mm -hmm. And you can't have a pity party, you know, helping the nursing home do bingo day or whatever. <laughs> it's really hard. Really, really hard. Um, and I think, so one of the things, again, just kind of to, do, to bring this in line with a lot of the things we're talking about, right? In the West, we tend to think of ourselves as one. Right, we or, orient everything around the individual. Right, democracy is about every individual gets a vote. Um, a, the ideas of freedom uh, are typically wrapped up in a lack of obligation mm -hmm. to something external to myself. Again, the problem is, is that's not actually the reality. Human beings, when we talk about social being social creatures, it's not just an emotional thing. It's actually how our brains develop and function. Right, our brains in in isolation, our brains suffer detrimentally in terms of their growth and formation right and so when we look at that and think neurologically i'm a social creature right the idea of uh you know should i go and get some help yeah we are not we are not from a physiological perspective we are not designed and created to handle our stresses alone right but again because of the and i while I appreciate uh, that the, a lot of the stigma around mental health um, support is going away, um, I want to kind of encourage and kind of motivate that even further and say it's not that a person is weak and so they go and get help. It's not that at all. It's that that is actually how we are designed as human creatures is to get the resources we need from the social circles that we have around us. And those may include professionals that um, are uniquely positioned to be in our circles uh, a little bit better. Well, anthro anthropologically speaking, humanity in all societies has had, had some form of a priest, a shaman, uh, a diviner mm -hmm. um, that you can go to. Now, how they go about that is different, but <laughs> still there's somebody within that culture that you go to mm -hmm. that's kind of really cool to think about and um going to going to 
go talk to somebody. Now, they may give you some crazy nonsense, but yeah. at least you went to somewhere, and that's better than sitting at home not doing anything. Um, but definitely, getting, again, when we realize that we are not as individualistic as the West really kind of drives that, that mm-hmm. we are, when we start to do that, we start to see that the stigma against getting help and talking about the problems that are overwhelming us is actually really ridiculous. It's it's really a I want to use kind words here. It's an uninformed position that I should be able to solve all my problems by myself. Right. Yeah, that's like the Uber mentioned like oh, I don't need I don't need to go to the doctor. I'm healthy and it's like no you're not. <laughs> right. Like I I I have needles, I have alcohol and I have string. I sure could have on a field stitch on myself but i didn't need to and i would have been wrong because it wasn't a cut it was an abrasion and it just needed a a really good band-aid and a cleaning um and so i feel like even if you have the tools uh you need to go talk to somebody else about it like they always say uh, uh, psychologists always have their own psychologist because they have to have somebody to talk to as well um but this has been a really, really long conversation. <laughs> so, um, well, you never give a preacher a pulpit. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's why they have uh, boxes on the sidewalks. Right. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Um, so, in closing, if we were to sum it up, people need to have a resiliency that is multi capable of being both your religious identity, whether pick your religion and also on the same side as the flip side of the coin a mechanism that you have a higher purpose that you find yourself connected to Mm -hmm. and then if you have that look for the integrity of yourself higher purpose the objective and subjective side of your your being as a um, individual uh, am I missing anything? If we were to bullet point sum it up. And then part of that is understanding you're part of a greater reality that you can't control, oh. but that you can connect with. Community. Right. And that, that is definitely part of your identity is your connection with community to include resources when you need them. Awesome. But this has been real awesome. No, it's been a lot of fun. Thanks. And uh, that is it. Spiritual Danger Close Out. <laughs>